coaches. Today, before we get started, I want to thank our sponsor, CoachPad. Uh, no matter if you draw scout cards by hand or use a program on your computer, CoachPad will give you back time by never stuffing a binder again before heading out to practice. First 13.3-inch electronic device allowing coaches to clearly display scout cards outdoors in the sun has been a game changer for programs this past fall and those currently playing all across the country. This new technology allows coaches to coach and not the monotonous task of stuffing and dealing with binders on the practice field. Check out the Coach Pad and Coach Pad Mini on thecoachpad.com. Please make sure you check out our sponsors, our affiliates. And here is another episode of the Gap Down Backer podcast. Uh, welcome back to another episode of the Gap Down Backer podcast. Um, today we have a, a friend of the channel, uh, a, a former assistant at my alma mater. Uh, he is currently the offensive line, uh, currently and new offensive line coach and run game coordinator at the University of Minnesota Duluth. Uh, coach Lauren Inslee. Coach, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. How are you doing? I'm doing good, my friend. I'm doing good. Uh, good. Unfortunately, the I mean, the last two times I've seen you was our, for our clinic and for uh, spring ball at OU. Um, unfortunately, you made the, the life choice to go far away, uh, but I get it. Um, but I mean, just for short version for people who may not know you, I mean, how do you end up as the run game coordinator, a line coach at uh, Duluth? Yeah, uh, so I was over at Ohio with uh, Coach Alan Rudolph. I was assistant offensive line coach over there. Um, really wasn't looking to leave. It's a great place with a great staff. And then uh, Duluth had an opening for an offensive line position, and they actually got a hold of Coach Albin, started making the connection. And then I actually have a ton of friends that either played here or have coached here at one point. So I knew I was going to a good program with good people, and that, that's really what matters at the end of the day. And once, once my buddies that have been here told me how great the staff it is and how beautiful Duluth is, I kind of jumped at it for sure. I get it. And like, I also want to kind of hit on because you've had an opportunity to work for uh, and work with however you want to phrase it. Um, two really good offensive line coaches as you've kind of been the assistant line coach. I mean, obviously, uh, Coach Prevost um, at South Dakota and, and um, Coach Rudolph, who I can't say enough about from personal experience. I mean, he, he's a good friend of mine. He'll just text me cherry blossom pictures randomly. <laughs> what, what was that kind of experience like working for those two guys? Because um personality wise they're obviously very different but I mean they kind of pull from each other at times and I know uh, they've kind of talked to each other a lot about what they do and how they approach things yeah so uh, like the systems are completely different so right there yeah at South Dakota we're a little bit a lot more spread wide open using RPOs to kind of handle some of the run fit issues that we we're getting um up front is a lot different than what we were doing at Ohio as I was transitioning out before I left South Dakota, I kind of had that connection with Coach Rudolph, and we were started communicating with him. We started watching some of his courses that came out that he has over on CoachTube. We got him on Zoom a few times, so he kind of taught Prevost and me at the same time some of the things that he had been doing. And I, I've known Coach Rudolph now for five, six years, um, and I met him really early in my coaching career, and he's been a resource for me the whole time. So. I made that connection, and then uh, at South Dakota, we started implementing a lot of Coach Rudolph stuff, but system-wise, it couldn't be farther from uh, each other. Uh, we, Like I said, we're spread at South Dakota, fixing things with RPOs, then we get over to Ohio, and everything is a check system, and now all of a sudden, we're adjusting the numbers with blocking schemes, having receivers dig out safeties, things like that running a lot more 12 personnel things. So I really think it was great for my career because I had always been an up-tempo, you know, 10, 11 personnel guy, um, using a lot of RPOs, using space, things like that. And then when I made the transition over to Ohio, I learned a whole new style of ball with the 12 personnel, how you can really mess up some run fits and things like that with it. So it's a great experience for me, um, being able to work with both those guys and, like you said, completely opposite personalities. That's 
about as far as opposite personalities as you can get. But it was a great opportunity working with those guys and the rest of the staff at both places. I was able to develop and learn a lot from the, from everybody that I've worked with so far. Now, the other thing I want to hit on is, I mean, this spring you had, correct me if I'm wrong, because I could be remembering stuff wrong. Did, didn't you help moderate the cold clinic this year? Yeah, yeah. So what was that experience uh, like? That, that was my second year doing that, actually. Um, I got a good friend, Keith Grabowski, and two years ago when it was the first time that it was virtual, he kind of reached out and asked if I would want to do it. And I jumped at it and it was a great experience. Um, you guys kind of see the clinics at the end, right? But to get there, there's about 20 to 30 minutes with me and whoever's presenting where we're making sure the slides are working. We're making, every, making sure everything's great, the video, all that kind of stuff. And a lot of that time I got to meet those guys. And I mean, we're talking NFL guys, high, high level power five guys. Um, and I got to meet those guys and, you know, pick their brain, get phone numbers and then reach back out to them. You know, the great thing about the offensive line uh, community is it's very open and it's a group that wants to teach each other and wants to help each other learn and grow and develop. So working those cool clinics have, have been really awesome for me. Uh, just getting to know those guys and be able to have some resources at my hands. Yeah. And like, I mean, obviously the cool clinics a whole nother animal in itself. And I kind of wish it would go back to in-person at some point. I can't tell you how mad I was because I'm in Ohio this I last know. spring and it's my like, you know, bucket list. I'm going to go to a cool clinic and now I'm in Ohio and I thought it was going to be live and go, but then they made it virtual. So, but I'll get there one day. It'll, It'll come back. It'll be in person again. So I know, but just like, just for a personal, like, cause I've always wanted to go and like COVID canceled that out. They didn't have back in person in, in these past two years. Yep. Um, it's kind and of from uh, talking with Bob, Bob Wiley. He's, he is planning on bringing it back. I think it's going to be a little bit of a modified, like you can't, we're going to film it. There, there can be an audience that's a exact not exactly the plan i'm not 100 percent sure on but basically do it live with having an, a virtual audience and record it because that's been one thing that was huge for a lot of people that i've talked to is being able to go back yeah. and listen to all that stuff you know and i i'm a junkie i got the cool clinic dvds going back to 2004 and i'm not even joking i mean coach you know coach rudolph so yeah he, he, when you talk about film junkies you know that, that's one of the top guys right there. And we'd be sitting at 4.30 a.m. Pulling, pulling in a DVD or some clips that we saw from the cool clinic years past. But uh, I, I just think it's awesome having some of those resources, you know. Um, but I do want it to get to get back live for sure. And I'm going to be down there for sure when it does. Yeah, I, I may or may not have VHS tapes that suddenly have appeared on a, a hard drive <laughs> yeah, of, of years. I'm not going to curb it up myself, but um, yes, I'm with you 100%. And as somebody who played offensive line, who has coached, I've coached everything at this point, but coached offensive line, um, who some of my best friends are offensive line coaches or acquaintances. Obviously, Coach Rudolph is one of them. Um, it, it's it's always a great experience. And that's something I, that's, again, kind of with you on my bucket list, uh, just like going to Africa, which got ruined for me at, couple, at COVID too. Oh, it's going to be in Kentucky. Not anymore, it isn't. So, I just, <laughs> Trust me. Um, but yes, and, and like I said, so, um, but also kind of with that, I mean, going back to our boy Rudolph, and I mean, one of the, I mean, he's very, he's a very good offensive line coach, um, especially in zone. And they, I think we both know that. And yep. I kind of, kind of one of my fondest memories uh, of, of this past year is um, obviously you were, you were with him at our clinic this year that we held in person. And obviously my speaker that was supposed to come at your couldn't make it. And God bless this man. You two were in that room for about two hours, just talking wide zone nonstop for two. It, like, so it, it, it's, it's one of my best memories that I've had this past year. I mean, he could have gone for eight to 10 hours. I know I'll he could that right now. I, I, I trust me. I know I could have just left him in that room the entire time and he'd been fine. And that for room sure. would not have left outside nope. the user restroom. Like, I mean, nope. I think maybe one person left in between session one, and session two, and that's because they had to go speak. Yep. Um, so, um, but yeah. And the passion he speaks about it. That, that oh. was one thing as a, you know, I'm not a young coach anymore, but I'm younger. 
and just watching him get up there and speak about it with so much passion about what he was talking about and the, you know, his feeling towards it, you know, he, he's a special one to watch for sure. Now, but kind of my, to my question to that point is, is you've had the opportunity, like I've studied wide zone a lot this off season. I mean, what is, what has that been? What have you been able to take from him uh, wide zone before we got and get into the mechanics of it from an offensive line standpoint, what were you able to take from oh, OU, him, the resources you've gotten, obviously, from the cool clinic? What what have you kind of been able to pull from there and from those experiences? Yeah, I, I think a lot of things, you know, I had never been a traditional wide zone guy, outside zone guy. Um, in the past, I've always been inside zone. And then COVID hit, and it gave everybody really an opportunity to kind of study some things that you might not have knowledge of. Um, and that was one of my big COVID projects was start studying the Browns, the 49ers, um, Baylor, Eric Matias, what some of the stuff he's doing over there. And I started studying those and getting all the film of it. And then when I transitioned over to Ohio, you know, they're inside zone. We didn't run any wide zone um, in my time there. They're going to run inside zone and they're going to keep running inside zone over and over again. And you're, you're going to try to make you stop it, you know. But that didn't stop uh, me and Coach Rudolph from talking and having those conversations about it because obviously he's ran at other places and learning some things there and picking it up. And, you know, I'm, I'm one of those guys where I'm, I'm constantly trying to learn some different schemes because you never know where you're going to end up. And now I'm at Minnesota Duluth and we're running a lot of wide, we call it outside zone here, but wide zone. Um, and now I'm implementing all those things and I'm, I'm using all of it here now. Uh, some of the biggest things are just, the stressing of teaching the backside hand and the backside foot. Everyone wants to keep talking about on reach blocks, the play side arm and the play, and the, getting the hips across and everything like that. But if you really drive at the angle you're supposed to and fire off the ball, okay, it's, it's coming from the backside and not really trying to teach too much of the front side of, of the scheme, I think is huge on it. Um, and then having no fear, running off the football and going. You know, I think there's too many times where you put too many doubts and fear in them, teach them how to run off the ball and then teach them if they get in a bad position, how to fix their positioning from that bad spot right there, I think would be the biggest things that I took from him as far as wide zones concerned. Yeah. Now, I, I obviously, like I said, they, they're not, they're not going to really run wide zone. That's, that's not who they are. They've been an inside zone team forever. Like that's just, yep. that's just who my alma mater is, which is fine. They do it really well. And, um, but like from, from as, as you work this, I mean, and you've kind of had some, I mean, and as you're approaching teaching this and the, the experience with it, what do you think are some things like people miss as you kind of like talk to other coaches? Like, cause the, the great thing is when you're studying something for a long time, you can ask people, I mean, what their common mistakes are. So what have you kind of been able to pull that are like common mistakes people try to run wide zone? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is, you know, over coaching the reach part of it and trying to get the hips across, you know, so like at Ohio, we didn't run wide zone, but we ran a lot of speed option where we're reaching it. Yeah. Uh, reaching across there. And I think too many people just try to teach their guys to throw the hips across instead of drive your hips through and allowing your hips to naturally come across. If it's going to get reached like that, I think that's one of the biggest things. Some of the techniques from the center point of view, when you have a shade play side, um, we used a hook'em technique, a longhorn technique at Ohio that I thought was really good, where we're forcing that head across and really trying to think of landmarks and getting our bodies across there. And as far as the backside cutoff, um, something that I took from a few of the guys that I talked to is really, tr as when you're on the backside, try to aim at the hit point of the next play side adjacent offensive lineman. Okay, so that's kind of the landmark you're going, and then you're cutting through there and yeah. getting up field on there. Um, one key mistake that I think a lot of people make when they're bucket stepping, especially on the cutoff part of it, is their second step still is pointed at the sideline. Um, if you guys can kind of visually think of it, you take that bucket step and then your guy takes a second step and that foot is still pointed straight at the sideline. Whereas you need to really angle, start your like departure angle upfield with that second step. You're not going to hit it and go completely vertical but it needs to be starting to point towards upfield. So those are, those are some of the key things that I think just talking with guys. And one of the biggest things is getting reps at it. You know, you, it, it's an expensive play. 
don't it's not something you just throw in there I think that's a mistake I see a lot of guys making is they use it as like a complimentary play and like we talked you know we run inside zone at Ohio and I think we did it you know pretty dang good um but it took a lot of reps to be good at inside zone the way we did it we didn't have that many reps to put into wide zone too you know so just being smart about how much time and how much reps you can get of a play I, I think is crucial yeah no, I, I agree like I said that that's kind of something we wrestled with whether we were going to stall it this year or not is is did we did we want to put all the eggs in that basket and where we're at or did we want to be able to still run some of our stuff because like you said it is especially when you don't have spring ball in Ohio for high schools yeah you're kind of limited on your time yeah we got a couple extra days this summer but it's still not the same when you're not in full pads. You know that as was I do. Like, sure. like I, I can, I can do so much with my offensive line during the summer, but you don't know who you have really until pads come on. It's not like yeah. college where you're recruiting some kids and knowing what you got. Um, and you know, just talking about that in general, some people think that they can have all these schemes, and as long as they teach it and the kids can say repeat back what their job and responsibility is, that that means that they can keep adding and adding. But the reality is if they can't instinctually react to things that happen on the field, they don't really know the play. You know, they might be able to tell you what their job, hey, I have a drive reach on this. Um, but they need to be able to react instinctually once they get on that field and just everything just come natural to them out there. And to get there, get them to that point, it takes a lot of reps. Yeah, I, I agree. And like now the other thing is from your studying, like, and I, I kind of want your opinion on this. Like, I know, I know there's a camp that really loves wide zone to the short side. I know there's a camp that really wants to have a tight end or a wing H-back, whatever the hell you want to call it, quote, unquote. I don't – that's semantics at this point. From your from your research and kind of your – and, again, it's going to vary on team and who you have, like, that's, that's and how people line up. But, like, what do you think typically allows offenses to take advantage of stuff more is that – is it that tight end side or H back side? Is it the short side? Um, is it something balanced like a double tight set? Because I mean, we talk. I mean, my alma mater will hit 11, 12 personnel, no problem. Yeah. Uh, what? What? From your personal opinion, what do you kind of think? I, I personally like holding both. Um, I think it makes you a little bit more di dimensional and gives you a little bit something different. Um, I think teaching the running back is important on the difference between going to attach tight end or not, or a tight, a play side tight end yeah. um, and teaching the tackles a little bit different. Uh, personally, I kind of got into running it without a tight end. Okay. And just running it to an open side tackle um, just because I feel like it freed him up a little bit, but at the end of the day, it's all about how they're fitting you and having the answers to it. There's some times where you're going to want that attached tight end or the wing guy and you, you're going to want him to chip the guy to make sure we get it reached. You know, if you're if you're running outside zone to make sure this ball hits the perimeter, I think having an attached tight end is a great solution to have that, right? He's going to help you chip that and get it. To me, when I, I think of outside zone, wide zone, I want to get flow. And if that defensive end is going to go to the sideline, I'm just going to take him to the sideline and my back's going to cut off of it. And that that's more how I think of it. Both work extremely well. It's just kind of how you want to manipulate the numbers, really. Yeah, no, like so that's that's always my curious thing with it is, I mean, but you can say that about a lot of stuff. Like when I talk to my offense coordinator, okay, some of that's based off are they an even front, are they an odd front? For um, sure. I mean, you know, as I do, typically if you have an odd front, you want to be more in some 11 or 12 personnel stuff, whereas an even front, you don't necessarily need that extra hat and so forth. It kind of just, again, it varies on your team and who you're playing. Um, but like, I mean, how big, and like, because you mentioned bucket step in there, and I and I know there's a camp of wide zone people who are not big bucket step people. Um, why, why the bucket step? What advantage do you think that gives you on certain parts of the wide zone? Uh, you know, I usually just use it on the backside. You know, um, when I can turn and get my head across and try to cut off some guys, um, I think you're running full speed, and especially if you got, if you're a backside tackle that has to cut off a three tech you're not going to get a lot of help from your guard because he's got to get going I think it allows you really to set that angle that you need to get there um, but like I said I think the key is more the second step right um, you know and I, I know there's a camp that doesn't agree with it and I'm not saying which one's right or wrong I'm just saying which one I know which one I've talked to guys yeah. about and which one works for for my guys and 
what, what I feel is successful, you know, um, to me, I think it's really hard to ask a guy to cut somebody off if you're taking kind of like a drop step more. Okay. Um, I want my body in front of them. And then if I overshoot it, there's some tools in our toolbox, um, out, uh, coach Mirabal at Miami. He's a guy that I talked to a lot about some of the tools that he, that he does with his guys. I mean, you can basketball box them out at that point. You can retrace, you can use the slingshot, all those, all those kind of different techniques I really feel are useful when you're bucket stepping and maybe you overshoot. I mean, I'd rather overshoot though when I'm trying to cut off than chase the guy all the way into where the running back is. I get that. And like I said, Mirabal also has a really good clinic on, I think on YouTube on, yep, yep. on the wide zone as well. Like he's, again, he's another one of our good ones. Um, yep. At, at, at and he's he a guy that I, especially with wide zone, I've, I've had a lot of conversations with him, with him about it. And he, he's awesome about giving his time back to the profession for sure. Yes. Like I said, like I said, I, I know I've watched that clinic, I think two or three times and he's, he does, he's, he does, he's done a good job for years back. I mean, obviously he was um, with coach uh, back when they were at Florida International as well. So, mm-hmm. um, but kind of the, the other thing I want to pick your brain on, because obviously pass pro is kind of the, of the utmost importance with how yep. much offenses throw the ball nowadays. I mean, what, I mean, and, and I know like I, and I, an episode pre, um, Prevost will come out before you and um, we kind of talked some pass pro and kind of talked about how he picked some stuff off Allen um, as well and kind of how that morphed some of his views on pass pro. I mean, kind of where do you, especially with offense linemen, especially as you're going in with a whole group you haven't really worked with, with before, um, in, I, I can't remember if you were you hired before or after spring ball. I honestly do not. After spring ball. After. So, so I've group, been here for about a month. So, 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 so about a, a, a group that you haven't had a chance to work with yet. Where are you going to start with pass pro technique with your guys? Um, I, have a, I have a mental image of a lot of line sets. Uh, from, from, from busy oh, exactly where I'm going to start. Yeah. You know, I'm going to start, you know, and you've, if Prevost, I'm sure has talked about how coach Rudolph does it. Um, I'm going to start with line sets and ankle leads and Australian hips, all those things. If you guys that are listening, if you've heard coach Rudolph talk about, those are all the things where he starts and making sure all that stuff is right. First, you got to make sure the feet and pass pro are right. Um, some guys want to teach the hands so fast because it's the cool thing to do right now is to teach the hands and pass pro. But with a, with a brand new group that I'm starting with, we're going to start with our feet first. We're going to make sure we have proper ankle lead, and then we're going to make sure that we have Australian hips. Um, so what, what I'm talking about with ankle lead is that I'm leading the set and my ankle's coming out first, not my knee. When your knee comes out and flares out like that, it opens up your hips, and now all of a sudden you're not square. Right. And then the Australian hips, I want my hips down under. Right. Um, so those are the things that I'm going to just hammer home every day line sets. Um, and it's not the most fun drill to do, but, <laughs> but it's something that needs to get done, you know, and, and I want to make sure that that's clean on that. So. I mean, yeah, yeah. No, and I'm not going to get super into the scheme just because that's not kind of what we're at today. And like, yep. um, that is what that is. But I mean, to your point, like, and, and I've, I've had those talks with Alan as well. And then I think, and I've kind of, as I've researched even more, I, I again, to your point, hands get a little over exaggerated. Uh, I mean, exaggeration is probably a bad word, but people ignore the necessary of the footwork or how to do it. And, and to your point, the, the drills are not exciting. They're not, they're not, I mean, but they're, they're effective in, in what they do in, in um, I, I love coaching hands as much as everybody else. Yeah. But if there's not the fundamental foundation there first, the feet, you could have the greatest hands ever, and you're not going to block guys in pass pro. Well, the other thing is, I, I think, and this is from a personal opinion, especially when you work hands first before feet, you get a lot of leaning. Mm-hmm. And it, 100%. It, it also, I do in pass pro, that causes more issues than, than you can handle. So yep. I mean, you got to be able to sit back into your stance and kind of like you said, Australian hips. Um, and kind of go from there. I mean, how much, I mean, where do you find the balance? Because obviously I've seen you work in practice before. I mean, I mean, I literally stood 10 feet from you guys yeah. months ago while you guys are working. Um, kind of, I mean, where, where, how do you, 
where do you find the balance in, okay, run, and I know, and I get it, part of it's based off your offensive system, yep. um, but where do you find the balance from, all right, run, run fundamentals, pass fundamentals, this is where I'm going to start being in a practice, this is how I'm going to progress through practice, how do you plan to approach that aspect? Yeah, like you said, the, the system's going to be completely different. How I would start a practice at South Dakota compared to here is going to be completely different, right? Um, I like getting them warmed up as they get out to the field. Um, we do pull strikes, which I'm sure you've seen before, where we're striking the goal post um, and getting them loosened up a little bit, hitting a little bit, and then getting their feet moving, um, doing some run drills first. Um, kind of individual stuff a little bit more and then working in some combo drills after that. Um, and then usually there's some kind of team period, something like that. And then I'll start working some of the past drills as we get into it, get closer to one-on-ones, things like that. As far as devoting your time, I think it's just important to know your system um, that you're running. If I'm going to run inside zone 80% of the time, well, then around 80% of my, my indie time should be focused on getting my guys ready to run inside zone. So I think that's that's a crucial part of it. Um, I personally like kind of separating days a little bit. It goes kind of back to a little bit of an air raid route where you're like, hey, today I'm gonna hammer home inside zone. Tomorrow I'm gonna hammer home mid zone, whatever your schemes are, but kind of in that indie time, I kind of like hammering in one specific thing. So their minds are on that um, specific thing. Uh, but that that's generally how I start working drill work. And then I think one of the biggest things that um, helps me is that I have a drill catalog. I know exactly what drills I want to hit. I also know, okay, these are everyday drills that we got to hit. These are, I got to get this very often, all those kind of things, kind of layering it in and then really marking down when you've done it. So now when I get into practice eight of fall camp, I know that I did line sets now six times and I got to decide if that's good enough or not and then as I watch the drills are they transferring over into the team that, that that's got to be something that you're looking at at all times I, I get you perfect. my other question for you to build off that is because I've, I've liked to ask a line coaches this 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 off season as I've done a lot of these is how, what is your plan or in space off your history and kind of is approaching pregame? Like, I think we, we as coaches have a, do an obscene amount of clinics. We do an obscene amount of podcasts. We do, we talk about everything. I mean, from practice to meeting room time, how we install stuff. Um, but I truly think game day gets ignored 90% of the yep. time. Like, and how to warm up and how to what you why you do your pregame ritual what you do why you do these drills I mean I don't know in 11 years of coaching I've been I've asked coaches why they do stuff pregame and they've said that's how they've always done it it's like why like why do you do the xyz drill like that's so what what is your pregame going to look like yeah I think the biggest thing is knowing the individual athletes too like if I have a bunch of old vets that are about to get ready that pregame warm-up is going to be completely different than a bunch of young pups that are getting out there and how I treat that is going to be important also knowing the individual and how they respond some guys like getting really jacked up and ready to go other guys want to be calm and relaxed so just how you talk to each one is really important I think that's something I've learned through the last couple of years of you know, I used to be that 25-year-old coach that's just screaming at everybody and getting really jacked up at all times right before the game. But not everyone plays really well that way. So getting to know your players and getting to know how, how's the, what kind of state of mind are you going to get them in to get their best version of themselves. And everyone's going to be a little bit different. But then when you talk about what we do um, drill-wise and stuff like that is I want to get their bodies warmed up. I want to start activating some of the muscle groups that they don't really think about sometimes. Um, that The lats, you know, some of the glutes, things like that, kind of act, start activating those that we're going to need. Um, and then a couple pops, not, nothing crazy really. Um, we'll do some step drills. And then if, depending on the D-line coach, if we, if we can, we get some quick one-on-ones, nothing crazy though. Um, early whistle, things like that. Um, some guys love taking four to five one-on-ones right before it. They feel like it helps them out. Some guys want to get one, call it good. Um, I had a really good player that I was coaching when I was an offense coordinator at Dakota Wesleyan. Um, 
he really just wanted to relax during pregame and he was an all-american player and i had never seen a guy kind of act like that but he was super calm didn't want to take a lot of reps didn't want to kind of you know um get super worked up and that that taught me like everyone's different you know everyone needs a different what i wanted to do i I was one of the first guys out on the field with the receivers. They're running around and I'm taking pass sets because that's mentally as a player, that's what I needed to do to get in my zone and how to feel everything and things like that. Uh, So I think the key is just knowing each individual and knowing your group really well and seeing what they need to do to to be effective. Perfect, Coach. And the last question I have for you before we go, because I've asked every O-line coach this recently. Um, I've even asked head coaches who are former O-line coaches this. So I think it's a fun question to ask because either catches them off guard or they know exactly what to do, but they all figured it out. Um, what is your favorite offensive line drill? Favorite offensive line drill. Ooh, this is a good question. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's probably, we call it domination drill yeah. and it's not going to sound very fun. And like, honestly, <laughs> not as a player, I would never say this, but I think as a coach, you can kind of develop some knee strain and driving the knees through contact or not through contact, but driving the knees through contact after you're fitted. Um, and basically you have the offensive lineman in a fit position on a drive block. You have a defensive lineman down low, and then you have a guy behind the defensive lineman for extra resistance. So oh, yeah, he's literally, job. as he's stepping, I'm sure you saw it at Ohio, but literally he's got it. The offensive lineman has to strain for every inch that he's going to get. Um, and I think when you do things like that, for one, I like starting in fitted positions so that guys can feel yeah. what it's supposed to be like. Because it does, you know, you can yell, hey, get lower, get lower, get lower. But that kid might not even understand what you're saying. But when you start them in a fitted position, now all of a sudden you can get them to feel exactly, hey, when you make contact, this is where I want you. Right. So you start in that fitted position and then that extra resistance just makes that guy work that much longer. And guys honestly hate it because it, it sucks, man. It, it sucks, but that's probably my, my favorite drill, really. Um, and then last thing I got for you before we go, because I got this text from Alan while we've been on here. Of course. Um, he wants me to tell you that he thinks the world of you and that he's super proud of you. So that, I was told to relay that to you. Um, just- that's awesome. Uh, for anybody that doesn't know Alan Rudolph, um, not only is he, in my opinion, one of the top O-line coaches in America, and I really mean that his, how he develops guys. I mean, I learned more in the last year working for him than I could have ever dreamed of. Um, and just how he develops guys and everything like that. But the person he is, you know, um, he's family to me. He, he, my sons, you know, they're asking my oldest, my three-year-old ask about coach Rudolph all the time. Um, and he, he's just a genuine person and all the guys at Ohio, you know, this, yes. but for everybody listening out there, uh, that's a good group of people. You know, Tim Albin is a great human being. That is um, a, yep. You're you're fortunate when you get to work for great people. And then on top of that, they're great coaches as well. So my time there, I learned a lot for sure. Yep. So, but he just wanted me to let you know that. So uh, coaches, uh, obviously give coach a follow on Twitter. Um, help him uh, not only expand his network, but uh, recruiting and anything else um, as coach goes through. Um, Coach, I mean, I hope you have an extremely successful season there at Minnesota Duluth. Um, Like, share, subscribe, all that lovely jazz. Check out our sponsor, Coach Pat, in the bio. Um, Otherwise, that's I think that's it for today. Coach, thanks for coming on. Thank you.